Thank you for being here and welcome. Welcome to the Energy Environment Committee. Thank you members for being here. Can we go ahead and, and begin our meeting? Certainly, go Madam ahead. Chair. Ralph, your operator with the CLA's office. Madam Chair, you have an eight item agenda. Would you like to proceed with item number one or, or another? We're going to go ahead and take uh, comment cards, get that out of the way. Certainly. General public comment? We're going to go ahead and take general public comment and comment cards as well. Okay. I know pursuant to Rule 62, uh, we've already taken public comment at our last meeting, but we're going to go ahead and extend that and give um, a total of 15 minutes for public comment. That's okay with everyone? Sure. I'm going to take my first set of cards. If I'm going to call uh, three people at a time, if you can please come to the table. Brenna Norton. Are you here? Yes. Do you want to come up? You, you filled out a card for item number three. Vicky Kershinsbaum, come on up. I hope I didn't butcher your name, ma'am. I'm sorry about that. Jennifer Tanner, are you here? Okay, we're going to start with these three speakers, and they've all filled out a card for item number three. Go ahead. Good afternoon. And before um, you start, I'm sorry, a minute each. Okay, one minute each. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you again to council member Martinez and Rue for this motion on the tunnels and the impact on LA ratepayers. And thank you to Kretz and O'Farrell and Kakorian for your great questions last uh, couple weeks ago now. Um, Brennan Norton with Food and Water Watch here in Los Angeles. Environmentalists and fishermen agree this project is terrible. Every environmental group in the state, the fishing industry, terrible for the Delta. Met and the ratepayer advocate are not credible on this. Regardless of whatever monthly bill increased will be a total cost to Los Angeles ratepayers, will be over two billion, 2,000 to 4,000 average per household. Forcing LA to pay for the tunnels after everything else we must spend our, our money on is ratepayer abuse. City Council must protect its residents by taking a formal position against this project. Thank you again. Thank you very much for being here. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Vicki Kirschenbaum. I'm with the Environmental Committee of Huddle for Humanity, a women's group in the Studio City area with about 50 members. We are absolutely appalled that the De De Delta Tunnels project uh, would go forward. It's about one thing, one thing only, and that is greed. Uh, agribusiness billionaires are trying to squeeze the very last drop of water out of this state for their own profit. As LA ratepayers, we are outraged that our rates would skyrocket to for no benefit for the Southland. Investing $17 billion while realistically far more in a project of no benefit to us is ridiculous. We should be taking this money and investing it right here in water reclamation, recycling, gray water installations, uh, on and on, jobs and water resilience for us here. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Jennifer Tanner. I'm an LA ratepayer and a taxpayer, and I urge you to uh, oppose this unfair rate and tax hike. The two tunnels used to be called the peripheral tunnels in the 80s. It went to ballot and the people of California voted no. Now it's been rebranded as the California Water Fix. This project would cost 17 billion and we'd see none too little of that water. Instead of the clean water, instead the clean water would go for unconventional drilling like fracking, mid-state, or to big ag growing almonds in the desert. We need money for local infrastructure, for rainwater capture, for upkeep to our pipes and aquifers, Already, almost 2 million Californians have no access to clean drinking water. No to the tunnels. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for being here. The next um, set of speakers is Lai Gad, Bruce Z Resnell. Is that how you pronounce your last name? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for acknowledging that. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> you said it. Uh, Sonia Pacheco, are you here? And I'm going to go ahead and call a, a, a fourth speaker. Connor Everts. Connor, are you here? I know Connor. Is he here? He's not here, He's not here yet. Okay. Well, we've called his name already. The next speaker is Sofia Quinones. And we'll start with you. Hi. My name is Lee Gad. I live in Los Angeles City. And uh, I am, uh, as a resident, a private resident, I am against this tunnels project. And we feel this is going to... 
I feel this is going to result in a big water rate hike for average citizens. And we have been subsidizing this water for big businesses and for big oil and gas companies, and we should not do that. We should invest the money in improving city and making the city a better and more livable place. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, go ahead, sir. Thank you. I am Bruce Resnick, Executive Director of Los Angeles Waterkeeper. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm also a L.A. resident and ratepayer, mm -hmm. and here to ask this committee to move forward opposing the tunnels. Um, we're told these tunnels, the California Water Fix, are needed to protect and restore the delta and provide water security. Unfortunately, they don't do either. And focusing particularly on the water security issue, um, these tunnels are going to divert limited resources we have and critical resources that are needed to invest in our crumbling water infrastructure, stormwater collection and treatment and infiltration, uh, reclaiming wastewater from all of our sewage treatment plants, including Hyperion, remediating our, remediating our contaminated groundwater, all of which will do a better job providing uh, local jobs, greening local communities, and providing local water. And what we're told all of the uh, above is an option. The reality is if we do all of the above, we are going to kill L.A. ratepayers. We have to prioritize. Uh, this is an opportunity to move away from our business as usual, pump and dump approach to water into a new paradigm and new future for L.A.'s water. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sonia Pacheco, and I'm currently a resident at Boyle Heights. And my concern regarding the tunnels uh, project is the fact that it's proposed to uh, occur a uh, $17 billion cost. However, based on my experience as a geologist and a caisson inspector, I have always uh, found it that all these proposed projects are always underbidded. They're, we always go beyond the proposed amount. And at this particular time, everything that I've read regarding this project that is available to us uh, does not guarantee LA residents any kind of benefit in any way other than increasing our um, costs in our water bill and also our taxpayers' uh, yearly increased property taxes. So it, I don't see the benefit of these tunnels in any way to Los Angeles residents. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Uh, the tunnels is just another example of the international water cartels um, that are privatizing our water here in California. I also believe that the facilities, the water treatment facilities, are another example of water privatization. As private corporations steal our drinking water, which is our constitutional right, um, we are being forced to drink toilet water, contaminated water, water um, where you cannot filter uranium, plutonium. Uh, and under laws such as intellectual property rights, pharmaceutical companies will not tell us what is in their products, neither will oil or gas. And you cannot extract these harmful chemicals from the water. So the facilities are also poisoning us. And you are in dereliction of your duty. You are violating our Constitution for allowing these private international cartels to privatize our water. No to privatization and no to organized crime. Thank you. I'm going to call the next six speakers. Olivia Lee, are you here? Armando Flores? Anne Marie Orte? Anne Marie Orte, are you here? And Bruce Campbell? Good afternoon, go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Olivia Lee with the LA Area Chamber of Commerce. We're here in strong support for the California water fix. Currently two thirds of our water comes from the Sierra Nevada mountains and flows through the Delta, including 30% of our water here in Southern California. We are heavily reliant on water supply from the State Water Project. In fact, during the drought, the city was dependent on MWD for up to 70% of the water needs for our residents and businesses. Some northern parts in the city in the San Fernando Valley are 100% reliant on Delta water due to pumping li uh, limitations. LA would not have survived our most recent drought without severe impacts on our residents and the economy. So it's time we take necessar necessary steps forward to ensure water security in our region by supporting this plan. The water fix will make the existing state water project more efficient and is specifically designed to reduce the waste of water and harmful impacts on native fish species in the Delta. In addition, this plan will make the entire state water project more adaptable to climate change, which is sorely needed. So we urge you to support the California water fix. Thank you. Next speaker. 
Good afternoon. My name is Armando Flores with the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA. VICA strongly supports the California water fix. This is an important investment that will modernize the state's water delivery system and ensure the reliability and quality of water for businesses and communities. As you know, Southern California experienced a historic drought in 2016, and the need for water was undeniable. It is critical that we ensure Los Angeles residents and businesses have a reliable source of water supply during the drought years when the city's own supplies are diminished. Many industries, including hospitals, schools, hotels, manufacturers, and government agencies rely on vast amounts of water just to function on a day-to-day -day basis. The water fix will support efforts to increase local supplies by providing high-quality water that can be recycled again and again to meet local demands and replenish local groundwater basins. California water fix is the most effective approach a solution that will, approach, that will provide safe, affordable, and reliable water supplies. We must modernize the current water delivery system and make the best investment for future water needs. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. I'm Anne Marie Odi, representing the Los Angeles Orange County's Building and Construction Trades Council. We have been here at City Hall many times recently to testify on the need to build more housing at all income levels. And we as a city are united to move forward and build more housing. With that commitment comes the challenge of creating the infrastructure to serve those homes. Water is a primary need. And we in the building trades know more than anyone else. Water doesn't start at the faucet, really. We do install those faucets, so we know what we're talking about here. And we have long advocated an all of the above water policy. Conservation, recycling, desalination, stormwater capture are huge parts of that. But actually, each of those methods is more expensive per household than the proposed cost of the California water fix. So we do have to be practical and include water fix on the agenda. On behalf of all of our members who live and work in LA, their families, I urge you to support California water fix and, of course, include any uh, requirement for reporting and oversight. Thank you. Next speaker, go ahead. Good day, Chair Martinez and Council members. I'm Bruce Campbell. Let's breathe and let the financial tea leaves settle. Proponents of the plan to build large tunnels at a depth of 150 feet, which would deprive the fragile delta of a majority of its water, are desperate to sucker agencies into signing on the legal financial dotted line to pay for their boondoggle to help major agribiz and fracking operations in western San Joaquin Valley, as well as the Silicon Valley. Just yesterday, the Westlands Water District called upon SACTO area water agencies and other water agencies not scheduled to pay for the tunnels to chip in. The big farmers don't want to pay for it. It's clear that huge agribiz frackers in Silicon Valley are in charge, as I mentioned. I noticed in an article yesterday that LA property owners will have to pay increased taxes even if not a drop of water is delivered to Southern California by the Twin Tunnels, a project which is likely to reach $70 billion, including cost overruns and debt repayment. Please wait a few months for a vote to get clarity on what agencies will chip in on this, boondog on this boondoggle, boondoggle project. And thank you, sir. Your time is up. Thank you very much. And please I'm pan the pickle. Thank you. The next uh, set of speakers is Charlie Wilson. Okay. Reverend Clarence Moon. Moore. Moore. Okay. Didn't realize that was an R. I apologize, sir. The next speaker is Shane Phillips. And that would conclude our speakers for today. Go ahead. Madam Chair, thank you very much. My name is Charlie Wilson. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Southern California Water Committee. We're a coalition of over 200 public and private entities focused exclusively on the issue of water reliability for Southern California. Our representation is over 27 million people from Kern County to San Diego. Through the leadership of Los Angeles City Council 60 years ago, the California water system actually was plumbed and created. Today we have an opportunity to modernize that system for the generations to come next. As we've heard before, two out of three Californians now receive their water through the California water system, through the, and the California water fix would actually help us to modernize that system for the generation going forward. As you've heard also, the alternatives, alternatives and all the above strategy is very important. Today, by, based on the hydrology and, and weather conditions, between 40 and 80 percent of Los Angeles' water actually comes from someplace else. This is an opportunity for you to supply that reliability for future generations here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. You were actually called ahead of me if you want to go first. Okay. 
Uh, afternoon, my name is Shane Phillips, and I'm here with Central City Association, an organization representing over 400 businesses and nonprofits in LA. We're here to speak in support of California Water Fix, specifically to talk about why we view it as a complement to local investments rather than a competitor. First, Water Fix is an insurance policy that lets us continue investing in local improvements without fearing the worst from threats of drought, climate change, and natural disaster. CCA strongly supports water capture, storage, and recycling, but the Bay Delta is a critical backstop for helping us through prolonged drought, where local measures can't always substitute for imports. Second, beyond the low average household costs recently confirmed by the ratepayer advocate, the costs of water fix actually adjust as demands for imports go up or down. That means that while water fix gives us the insurance policy we need against extraordinary drought or disaster, we're still incentivized to upgrade our local water infrastructure and continue cutting demand. So we believe the two approaches are complementary. CCA has been a longtime proponent for ensuring our region's wa longtime water security through California Water Fix. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. I'm Reverend Clarence Moore. I'm president of the Los Angeles Ministers Forum. Um, I'm here to urge you to vote no against this uh, water fix. Um, the Los Angeles Ministers Forum work with low-income families. Um, we help provide uh, services to them for um, their utility bills, uh, their mortgages, and try to help them stay in their homes. This rate increase would be a major impact on some of the low-income families. So I urge you to vote no. Uh, you must consider the families that are in Los Angeles, how this would affect them. Uh, a rate increase? No. Not even a penny. Some people have to choose between food, paying their bills, uh, and, and just living. So the low-income families are going to be hit hard with this. So I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and that concludes our public speaker cards for all items, including general public comment. I did receive something late on Charday Fernandez, so we'll put you on the record as against um, the proposal on item number three. Uh, members, I'm going to go ahead and let's run through the agenda. If there's no objection, I'd like to ask that we... Go ahead and approve items four through eight on consent. Are there any objections? I, I'd, like, I'd like to poll number eight if I could. You want to poll number eight. Okay, so let's go ahead and if there are no objections, just approve items four through seven on consent. No objections. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Farrell. Uh, Mr. Corretz, do you want to go ahead and discuss number, item number eight? Can we read that into the record before he begins Probably discussion? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Item number eight relates to Department of Water Power and City Attorney reports and ordinance relative to establishing design build criteria for the Haynes Generating Station. Do you have staff from Department of Water and Power? Are there any staff here on, on item number eight? I take you have questions? Yeah, I just have one short department. question. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Sunny Chu. I'm the manager of major projects. Go ahead, Mr. Corbett. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to clarify that this item has nothing to do with what Haynes is going to become next, that this is just about doing demolition and scraping the land and not about what kind of power usage will be utilized in the future there. Correct. That is just a demolition project at this point in time. This was originally built in the 1960s, and so the function of these units are no longer needed. They're decommissioned and the infrastructure is dilapidated and uh, pre presents a safety hazard, a maintenance issue for the plant itself. So regardless of what we do there in the future, we do need to have this removed at this point in time. And so we're just doing de demolition. We're not setting any policy for what we're doing there in the future, no. if anything. Not at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that it? That's we go it. ahead and approve this item. Without objection, that will be the order. Let's go ahead and take up item number one. Um, we have members from the Mayor's Office, Bureau of Sanitation, and DWP. You can please come up to the front. We're going to discuss items two and three together, so we're going to take up item one first. Can we go ahead and sure. read that into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number one relates to Mayor's Office, Bureau of Sanitation, Department of Water and Power report. I actually verbal update relative to the sustainability plan, one water initiative, and urban water management plan. Thank you very much. Uh, and members, this is the follow-up of uh, last month's discussion. I thought it would be beneficial to have a refresher of the city's broader approach to when it comes to water. Um, 
and our commitment to local water, and particularly those of us who represent the San Fernando Valley. I know there's three members on this committee um, that represent the Valley, and I want us to talk also about the efforts of um, water remediation when it comes to those Valley members um, and those two million people that live in the Valley as well. So who wants to go first? You want a member of the Mayor's Office go? Yep. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Liz Crossan. I'm the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer. There are uh, about five members of the Sustainability Office right now and we work to implement the Mayor's Sustainable City Plan. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the plan. Uh, the plan itself was released in 2015. It was the result of a long stakeholder process that included many environmental and community groups. It also included consulting with our city departments. And in the release of the plan, there was also the establishment of departmental CSOs, so chief sustainability officers in each of the departments to work with us in collaboration and with you and your, and your staff in the implementation of the goals and strategies that are set forth in the plan. The plan itself is divided into three different sections. I know we're focused on water today, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that you know there are 14 different chapters in the plan, and although water is one chapter by itself, it certainly is weaved throughout the plan as many of these goals and strategies are approached um, in an integrated manner. So for instance, green jobs are closely linked to our stormwater capture and green infrastructure efforts. Environmental justice is something that's important to urban greening and green infrastructure and, and increasing park space. So we really try to look at this as an integrated approach, which I think is a unique element of the City of Los Angeles Sustainable City Plan. So the local water chapter is chapter one in the plan, and it sets forth some very clear targets. Uh, each chapter has a target for 2017, for 2025, and for 2035. Our first target for water was to reduce our per capita water use by 20% by 2017. We did meet that. We actually exceeded that. And I'll, I'll show a graph in, the min in a minute to, to show that. Um, our, our second target there is the 2025 goal. So that's related to reducing our purchase of imported water by 50% by 2025. So that's really focused on reducing how much we buy from Metropolitan Water District, both from the State Water Project and from the Colorado River. And then the 2035 goal is related to getting to 50% local water by 2035. And that local water is defined to not include the LA aqueduct. So that is really focused on local water here in the LA basin. So I know that sanitation and DWP are really going to probably go into some technical details. But as far as an update on where we are on local water, just a couple points. One of them is that we are making progress on groundwater remediation as DWP moves forward there to implement their plan, but also acquire much needed funding from the state under the water bond, the Prop 1 um, initiative. So I'm sure they'll talk about that. I think that's, that's really the anchor of our local water uh, strategy, because when we think about recycled water and groundwater replenishment, and we think about stormwater capture, if we don't have a clean groundwater basin to put that water and then extract it from, we don't really have the solution that we need. So it's really an integrated approach. And on the recycled water side, we, as you probably know, you know, we just completed the EIR for the Tillman plant to do that groundwater recharge. And we're really working collaboratively with West Basin Municipal Water District on the west side to think about how do we expand and double in the next few years the amount of recycled water from Hyperion that we produce to, to West Basin. And then we all need to really think about what the long-term strategy is for Hyperion and how we reduce that ocean discharge and really make that a true water reclamation facility. And lastly, I just wanted to, to show you the, the LADWP's um, demonstration of our reduction in GPCD. So this is our per capita water use. And you can see here that despite the fact that the drought was declared officially over, Los Angeles really continues to lock in those conservation behaviors. And despite the fact that there are municipalities across the state that are backsliding throughout this summer, and we have done quite well. This is a cumulative 12-month rolling average, and so we maintain that 20% reduction so far. Um, and 
I just want to mention, in addition to the plan, that there was exec executive directive number five, which was an early action of the plan in October 2015. So that was sort of the first drought response. We need to get to this 20% by 2017. We need to get to local, you know, reduce our dependence on imported water. But it also established the mayoral water cabinet. And that water cabinet is made up of general managers and assistant directors and general managers um, to meet monthly to talk about GPCD, but also to talk about our long-term future for water and local water supply. And it's co-chaired by the Chief Sustainability Officer and the Deputy Mayor of City Services. So I'm here to answer any questions, but I really appreciate the opportunity and certainly your focus on local water. And I know our office is really looking forward to continuing this, this partnership on this really critical Thank issue. Thank you for being here. Members, are there any questions of the Mayor's office on this? Let's go ahead and move on to the Bureau of Sanitation. Good afternoon, Adel Hashkali, I'm the Assistant General Manager for LA Sanitation. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, uh, the LA One Water 2040 plan is something that we're going to be coming back for detailed plan, uh, presentation to you in October. Uh, we briefed some of your staff already. But really, with the challenges facing of us in LA when it comes to water, including flood control, dependence on imported water, water quality, and climate change, the One Water LA plan is a roadmap for integrated water management in an environmentally, economically, and socially beneficial manner. We refer to it as connecting the dots, drops, and the hearts. The plan is built on integration, innovation, and inclusion, uh, uh, while maximizing local water supply, providing multi-benefits, and adapting to climate change, but most importantly, engaging the community across the city throughout the process. This plan is jointly led by LA Sanitation and LA Water and Power, in addition to engaging the community, we engaged all of the city departments to identify opportunities for integration. For example, working with the LA Zoo on their master plan, how we can integrate stormwater capture and recycled water, and working very hard at the Hyperion plant with LAX to integrate recycled water as part of the LAX plan upgrades that's being done. One of the anchors of the plan is increasing water recycling, as uh, Liz mentioned, and groundwater recharge, especially in the San Fernando Valley. The Tillman Water Reclamation Plan has been upgraded to provide 30 million gallons a day of advanced purified water for groundwater recharge. In addition, we're increasing the available water at Tillman for recycling by increasing the version of stormwater into the sewers, but also rerouting sewers to the areas with the maximum recycling demand and groundwater recharge. In the San Fernando Valley with water, with water conservation, the wastewater flow is, is the lowest on record. So what we're seeing is less flow to recycle. So we have to think as part of this One Water LA plan, how can we bring wastewater away from Hyperion into Tillman, and we're gonna look at building a sewer from the East San Fernando Valley to the West San Fernando Valley to maximize treatment at Tillman so we can do more groundwater recharge where it's most beneficial in the San Fernando Valley. We also were looking at strategic locations in the city uh, for satellite water reclamation plants to meet demand where it's far away from our water reclamation plants. Uh, specifically, we're focused on an area around Rancho Park and UCLA where we think there's a five million gallon demand that we can build a satellite plant to provide water for the parks and golf courses along with UCLA. We're also identifying opportunities at the Hyperion Water Reclamation Plant for increased recycling through partnership with West Basin and also with our regional uh, agencies, sister agencies across the city. Maximizing capture of stormwater for reuse and recharge through, through regional and distributed projects will not only enhance our local water supply, it will enhance our water quality, which we have and we have mandates to do, but also our, and our compliance, minimize flooding, and most importantly, enhance the quality of life in our communities. Our enhanced watershed management plans, which basically the plans to comply with our stormwater permit uh, is based on stormwater capture and infiltration for four watersheds. Identified huge opportunities for stormwater capture, reuse, and infiltration. We estimate that we can capture and infiltrate and reuse up to 125,000 acre feet of stormwater annually, uh, equivalent to water for over 1 million people in Los Angeles. The One Water LA plan is a, a dynamic, continuous process of engaging the community at all levels. We will be coming back to you soon in the next month as we finalize this plan and we initiate the uh, EIR process. Thank you. Members, are there any questions for sanitation? 
Ron, so I can move on to DWP and the um, urban water management plan. I don't think that goes any further. You guys are going to have to switch seats. Mr. You have a collective we'll question a after they're done? Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman, uh, Martinez, Council Members. I'm David Pettyjohn. I'm the Director of Water Resources for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. With me today is Delon Kwan, and he is the manager who is responsible for the development of the city's urban water management plan, which we're going to be presenting to you today. So a little about the historical supplies for the city of Los Angeles. Over the last 34 years, you see here the Los Angeles aqueduct in red. And the real takeaway here is you see that red eroding over time. And if you look back 34 years ago, um, we were getting about 530,000 acre feet of water from the LA Aqueduct. Uh, if you fast forward to 2016, we got 58,000 acre feet of water from the LA Aqueduct. So in recognition of this, the mayor uh, put forth his ED5 and the Sustainable City Plan goals to try to get the department to try to reverse this trend. And the Urban Water Management Plan is the department's effort to try to do that. Next slide. So how did we come up with the goals that are in the Urban Water Management Plan? Of course, it was the Mayor's uh, 85 and Sustainability Plan uh, in the upper right-hand corner. But the specific plans that really feed into the exact uh, local resource initiatives that go into the plan that we'll be talking about today are the Recycle Water Master Plan that we developed, our Groundwater System Improvement Study, that's the remediation effort in the San Fernando Valley, our Stormwater Capture Master Plan, and then uh, today, we presented to our board our new water conservation potential study, which I think we've given you all an executive summary of today. So local resource program, essentially a three-legged stool, a capture, conserve, reuse stool. Um, if you look here at the San Fernando Basin remediation, um, as Liz mentioned, that's kind of foundational, a lot of the local resource initiatives. Doesn't make a lot of sense to capture a lot of storm water or recharge advanced treated recycled water if you can't pump it out of the ground because it's contaminated. So we've got to get the basin cleaned up. We have plans to do that. Uh, those plans will be in place and it should be up and running by about 2025. Uh, the con water conservation potential study has showed us a pathway forward to essentially double, a little more than double actually, the current level of water conservation that the city has. So cur currently we do over 100,000 acre feet of hardware based conservation. We want to double that. Uh, the stormwater capture master plan, currently the city is capturing about 60,000 acre feet of stormwater each year, infiltrating that into the ground. We want to double or triple that amount. Recycle water right now, the city is doing about 10,000 acre feet of recycle water every year. We want to increase that by about sevenfold. Next slide. You saw this slide last time. Um, on the upper left is where we are today. You, uh, you can see the gray, the light gray there on the left is the state water project. Um, some of the local resource development is in the other colored shades. In the middle, on the lower part of the slide, you see where we want to be in 2040 in an average year. And this, would, this is it, if we're successful in achieving all the goals we've set for ourselves in the urban water management plan. In a normal year, this is where we want to be. And the upper right is uh, a dry year in 2040. So we've got all the local resource development uh, that we plan on building, but we hit a dry year. And this is what the portfolio is going to look like. And you see the dependence upon the State Water Project and the Colorado River Aqueduct is just above that in the light blue. It makes up about 45 percent of our water coming from the Metropolitan Water District. So I, I thought of a little better way to kind of show uh, how we build up our uh, supply portfolio. So we start off with what our demands would be in 2040 if we do nothing. So if we don't build any additional water conservation projects from now until 2040, the city's demands are going to grow pretty dramatically, up to 600 and 75,000 acre feet. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, the water conservation potential study shows us how we can reduce that man demand down to a level of demand that would meet the requirements of the sustainable city plan for gallons per person per day. And that would require us to conserve another 110,000 acre feet of water, getting our demands down to the target level of 2040 in the sustainable city plan, which is 565,000 acre feet. So how do we meet that demand of 565,000 acre feet? Well, in a normal year in 2040, we anticipate the LA Aqueduct will produce about 286,000 acre feet. Now that's a significant reduction over what it used to produce. It was over 500,000, as you recall. 
Uh, we've reallocated about half of the LA aqueduct system to the environment in the Owens Valley over time. So that's the first block of water. The second block would be our local groundwater. This assumes that we've re uh, captured all the groundwater that we've uh, lost due to contamination in the Owens Valley. And we're also uh, pumping the other groundwater basins that we have adjudicated pumping rights. So that's our full adjudicated pumping right coming out of the ground every year. Recycle water, this is a seven-fold increase over what we're currently doing, so we achieved the goals there. And then the remainder uh, is made up of two supplies, uh, water that comes from the Colorado River Aqueduct. That's our treated water we buy from the Metropolitan Water District, serves East LA and the Harbor area. And then the State Water Project supplies, that's untreated water that we treat ourselves at the LA Aqueduct Filtration Plant. It comes in uh, to the north part of the San Fernando Valley. So that's a normal year. So what happens in a dry year? How do we meet these demands? So in a dry year, demands have a tendency to go up. They go up because people water outdoors more in a dry year. And cooling towers use more water. So the city's demand just trend up. That's the historical uh, dry year scenario that we've seen. So we'll have to do more in the area of conservation, to, again, to get down to that level, to meet the sustainable city plan goals, get back down to 565,000 acre feet. We think we can do that with a conservation effort of 143,000 acre feet a year. So how are we going to meet that supply in a dry year? Well, in a dry year, the LA Aqueduct dries up. So in 2013, this is what the LA Aqueduct actually produced, 50,000 acre feet, not very much. Groundwater, we're still assuming we get our full adjudicated pumping right. Every drop we can pump out of the groundwater, we're going to pump. The recycle water, we've met our seven-fold increase in recycle water. And that leaves metropolitan. And here's the Colorado River aqueduct water, the treated water we buy from Met every year for East LA and the Harbor area. And then this is the untreated water we're going to need to buy from Metropolitan in a dry year in 2040. It all comes in uh, through the State Water Project into the north part of the San Fernando Valley, goes through our LA Aqueduct filtration plant and serves our customers' needs. So you can see there's a pretty heavy dependence in a dry year in 2040 on the State Water Project. And of course, the State Water Project water all comes from one place, Delta. Next slide. So this is... A uh, question you asked last time about, well, you know, if we don't do the tunnel fix, what's the impact? So without the tunnel fix, Metropolitan has projected that there's about a 25% reduction in water supplies from the state water project. Since we only buy about half our water in a normal year from the Metropolitan Water District, we'd have to absorb perhaps 12% of that if uh, Metropolitan was just allocating the water that came down its aqueduct systems. So we'd have to make up that water, uh, that 12% with additional conservation but you have to remember that uh, to do the, when we get to 143,000 acre feet of uh, uh, additional conservation, we've, we've dropped our GPC down to 86 gallons per person per day. Right now we're at 103. So that's a pretty significant effort. And as you drop those conservation efforts, uh, it becomes harder and harder to get that next increment of cons conservation. So really not reasonable to think that we can make up all the state water project with conservation. Um, we could uh, go to higher levels of our shortage, emergency shortage criteria to make up some of that. Uh, we could try to push more Colorado River water into our system, but the most Colorado River water we've ever been able to take into our system was less than 100,000 acre feet. It was 95,000 acre feet. So we're still going to have a significant uh, dependence upon the state water project. Uh, and that state water project water really needs to be reliable. So. Here's the one scenario that I haven't mentioned, and I'll just do it verbally. What happens if that 206,000 acre feet of state water project water goes away? What if you have land subsidence in the delta that shuts the delta down? What if you have sea level rise? What if you have storm surge? What if you have earthquakes that shut the delta down and you don't have a way to get water through that delta? Well, the city is going to be in a position where it has to try to come up with a significant amount of water, and there are going to be areas of the city where uh, we just can't get water supplies. The only backup water supply we have for the San Fernando Valley is the state water project. So there are some scenarios out there, how likely they are. Uh, you know, it's, it's what keeps a water resource manager awake at night, frankly, is that the worst case scenario, uh, you're looking for a couple hundred thousand acre feet of water and uh, there's nowhere to find it. So th that's really what I, th in my opinion, what it really boils down to as far as the urban water management plan, our local resource development, we can do everything that we've been asked to do between now and 2040. And if the worst case scenario happens, we're going to have a shortage that we just are going to have a very difficult time finding a way to fill. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Mr. Gokorin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so 
<clears throat> the percentages that you've given in this chart are citywide percentages. Is that right? That's correct. So if you were to isolate the San Fernando Valley, I assume the ratios would be wildly different uh, than these. That's correct. The San Fernando Valley is, is more dependent upon the state water project than other areas of the city. How much so Colorado River water comes to the San Fernando Valley? Uh, virtually none. I mean, we can, we can push maybe 56 uh, CFS through the Gregg Avenue pump station out into the valley, but no more than that. So it's a very small amount. So if that state water project source of water went away from the San Fernando Valley, we'd be relying on water trucks. Yeah, it, it, the, the problem is, is that, you know, we've, the system is designed to have an insurance policy. Uh, in normal years, yeah, you'd be fine without your insurance policy. But if you find yourself in a worst case scenario or an extended drought, you get to the end of that extended drought and then you have a catastrophe hit you, uh, then the backup supply isn't there. And that's what the insurance policy is designed to, to meet uh, those critical dry year needs and then the, not only a critical dry year need but, but a critical dry year and then you have a catastrophe that shuts down one of your systems. So yeah, the San Fernando Valley is, is the most vulnerable part of our system. So in, in terms of backup plans, my view has been for decades that the best backup plan is the San Fernando Valley aquifer, the groundwater reservoir that has more storage capacity than any of the Northern California dam projects that, you know, we're going to spend billions on. Um, but what I want to try to understand better is this groundwater limitation mm -hmm. of 129,000 acre feet. What's the basis for that limitation? Is that, a, is, that a, is that a physical capacity or is it a water rights limitation? It's a water rights issue and it's, it's a, an adjudicated pumping right. So the city has uh, the San Fernando Basin Judgment. We share that basin with Glendale Burbank and a few other smaller pumpers. But we have an adjudicated pumping right to pump 87,000 acre feet a year of indigenous groundwater out of that basin. So there are limitations on our ability to pump that basin. Right now, we're not even pumping the 87,000 acre feet because it's contaminated. So that, I'm sorry, but that's based on indigenous water. If Correct. we used it as a storage facility for storm water or imported water, uh, from some other source, would that affect our water rights uh, and, and increase that number? Yes, it would. It would. Uh, you could use the San Fernando Basin as a storage facility. We are re rebuilding the McClay High Line to try to spread excess LA aqueduct water. Uh, the challenge becomes in an extended drought because all storage has a tendency to be depleted during extended droughts. Uh, and when you get to the end of that extended drought, you're allocating water. Uh, the Metropolitan Water District has been in that situation uh, multiple times, just in the last 10 years. Uh, so storage does have a tendency to dry up in extended droughts, so you could potentially put a lot of water into the San Fernando Basin, maybe a few hundred thousand acre feet. But um, if you were in an extended five-year drought like the one we just went through and you had uh, depleted that basin, uh, you're going to be back down to your adjudicated pumping right and if you continue to mine the basin, you run into other problems. I mean, you know, base, groundwater basins around the state have experienced land subsidence and other right. things when those basins get mined. So there are physical limitations, that, like you mentioned, on your ability to pump those basins. Now, in terms of using it uh, as to, to greater capacity as a storage facility, obviously the biggest impediment is the contamination. Um, now, this has been a super fun site since 1986. Um, I, for the life, and, and what I heard you say, which I almost fell out of my chair, was that we'll be ready to go by 2025 on this. Why has it taken 40 years to deal with this contamination issue in the San Fernando Valley Reservoir? And, and that's what we're, we're looking forward now. But I've kind of been hearing this my entire public life, in fact, even well before my public life, that, you know, we're working on cleaning up the groundwater in the San Fernando Valley. Why? I get that it's complex. I get that it's difficult. But so are all these other alternatives. They're difficult and complex and expensive. Why has this not been done yet? Well, we've been uh, doing some things there. I mean, uh, the... Uh one thing we did do at the Tunga well field is we put in uh, wellhead treatment facilities there. So there are, there are things that we have done to try to address the contamination. So 
the department hasn't just been uh, ignoring the problem. Uh, we've been addressing it. We've been pursuing the uh, potentially responsible parties. We've been pursuing Prop 1 money to try to mitigate some of the rate impacts that they're going to be because of the cleanup. Cleanup pro project may cost us about $600 million. It's taken a while to really study and figure out exactly what the extent of the contamination is, what the constituents of the contamination are, and what type of facilities it will take to actually treat that groundwater once you pump it out. So all that takes a fair amount of time. Most water projects take a decade to build. And so it's not out of the ordinary that it's taken us this long to try to really wrap our minds around it. One of the, one of the projects that you, one of the documents you saw that fed into the urban water management plan was our groundwater system improvement study. That's a long-term study. We put in about 100 uh, wells to extract water from various locations in the valley, study the constituents of contamination that are in that water, identify those plumes, so that when we did build the treatment facilities, it wouldn't be a, a waste of time and money. We would know exactly where the contamination plumes are, exactly what the constituents are, and we would design a robust system that would able, be able to deal with all of those constituents. So it is, uh, you're right, I mean, it's a very time-consuming process. Uh, we do plan to have it up and running by 2025. Okay, so last question, then I'll, maybe I'll come back around again. But um, so as of today, with the isolation that's been done today, with the identification of the scope of the plume, as of today. Um, yeah, I know there are a number of operating units throughout the aquifer that have been kind of identified and uh, uh, can be treated separately. So if you take right now what our maximum storage capacity in the usable operating units in the aquifer, how much are we underutilizing that storage capacity by now? I think that we could probably store several hundred thousand acre feet of water in the San Fernando Basin. Uh, that's in the, excess of what in we, excess have, of what we have now. Uh, of our adjudication. So, you know, we can, the, uh, the safe yields of the basin, the current safe yield is set at 87,000 acre feet. Now it varies a little bit based on return flow credits, and, but on average it's about 87,000 acre feet. You could potentially put several hundred thousand more acre feet of water in there that would give you a storage buffer to buffer you against dry years. Right. The challenge is that once you deplete that storage, at that point, if something goes wrong, then yeah. you're back to square one. It's one-time water, but, but it is, you know, and, and it sounds like a lot, but really it's, it's a year and a half's worth of, of water, or so um, it's, it's one-time right. water. It's about okay, right. thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Farrell, but Mr. Koretz had a really quick, because I want to go in order. So yeah, I, just, just, just to follow up on this, uh, when I was on the MET board, it feels like it's been a couple of years now, I got a commitment from MET to supply $20 million towards this effort and to provide it in services and staffing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as I understand it, we have never been able to access that money. Um, is there a reason why we haven't been able to do it? And can we not find some way to get there? That's a big chunk to get started with that we're not taking advantage of. Yes, I, I remember that initiative that you, you put forward, and, and we did pursue it for a while. It wasn't Metropolitan Water District's uh, fault that it didn't move forward. Um, there were some concerns that we wanted to uh, not piecemeal the approach. So what we had originally thought about was trying to replicate what we had done at, at the Tonga well field, where we were installing wellhead treatment. And uh, the initiative that, that you worked on was to do more of that. And after the groundwater system improvement study uh, came out and some of the internal decisions were made, the decision was to move uh, to more of a hybrid approach where you had some wellhead treatment, but predominantly a large centralized treatment at the Hollywood pump station. And so because that was the direction we thought would be the most robust treatment technology for the for the basin, that was the direction we went. And so that's why we didn't uh, move forward to a strictly a wellhead treatment approach, which was what we had originally thought about with the Metropolitan Water District. So there's still no way to take advantage of the $20 million that they've offered us? No, actually, the Metropolitan Water District is, is um, very generous with their LRP money. And uh, if you have a groundwater basin that's contaminated and you uh, need funding to recover that water, 
uh, the Metropolitan Water District will subsidize your efforts there uh, if the water recovery cost exceeds the cost to purchase MET water. Now, in the San Fernando Basin, if we're successful in getting PRP money and if we're successful in getting Prop 1 money, the chances are that our cost to produce the water will actually be less than what it costs us to buy an acre foot of MET water. If it's below the cost to buy an acre foot of MET water, then Metropolitan doesn't subsidize it. If it costs the local agency more to produce an acre foot of local water than to buy MET water, then they will make up the differential for you to get you down to what their cost of water is. So if, we do, if the cost to produce water in the San Fernando Valley does exceed the MET cost, the Metropolitan Water District will, will provide us with a subsidy. So, Mr. Corbett, I have to go Mr. O'Farrell because he was next, just to be fair. All right. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, okay. Uh, we'll come back. All right. Um, to be fair. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. O'Farrell. So, so in relation to the education, uh, adjudication rather, yes. of the recycled water from the San Fernando Valley uh, Aquifer, is that percentage fixed? Is it etched in stone? How long do we have that adjudication level or percentage? Might that change? And I, I'll tell you where I'm going in a second. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I think it actually will change, uh, Council Member O'Farrell. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the adjudication was based, was done, and the safe field study was done in the San Fernando Basin back when it was predominantly orange groves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, urbanization has and paved over. A lot of trees. Yes. Right. That, that, that's avocados. right. Pre-World War II, pre-World yes. War I. So, uh, we... I anticipate that there will be a new safe field study five to seven years from now, and my prediction, and I'm not a, I haven't done the study, but I, I predict that we're, our adjudicated pumping rights is actually going to go down once that safe field study is done, because mm -hmm. the water that used to infiltrate naturally into the San Fernando Basin now runs off. Now we're trying to reverse that through stormwater capture and infiltration into that basin, but right now a lot of that water is flowing down uh, the LA River. And you'd mentioned a sevenfold. Uh, increase in our um, contamination remediation efforts uh, leading up to 2025 or li over the next handful of years, more or less? Well, that sevenfold increase will be in our recycled water program. In the recycled water And program. that's citywide. Citywide. So, so where I'm going with that is, um, uh, can you elaborate on the funding piece for making that happen? Sure. Um, we, when we passed our five-year rate action, uh, as part of the five-year base rate increase, there was uh, a piece of that five-year base rate increase that was for local resource development. And a piece of that local resource development was not only purple pipe projects, recycled water projects, but also the project that Adele mentioned, and that's the uh, advanced treated recycled water project to recharge the San Fernando Basin. Mm -hmm. uh, so those two projects are actually already in the base case, uh, the base rate increase. So that's how it'll be funded out of the base rate. It'll be funded, but yet the purple pipe program is on hold from my understanding. Well, I think I know which one you're talking about. There is, there is one uh, purple pipe project in your district. Mm -hmm. um, it is on hold right now. Um, this morning we discussed it, and we're going to uh, get back to you with a report on what's going on with that project mm -hmm. and uh, you know, why it was put on hold, and, and we're going to get together with your staff, uh, and we'll be discussing that with you. Because I know money, time, and resources were spent on that, and I'd hate to see that lost. Uh, uh, just to, to continue this theme a little bit, Ms. Crossan from the mayor's office mentioned uh, um, the, oh, actually, let, that was answered. Um, let, me, let me go to this one. Adele, you mentioned the um, long-term strategy at Hyperion. No, I guess that was you, Ms. Crossan, who mentioned that, the long-term um, strategy for Hyperion, right? I or was it, it you, Adele? What, what the, was it both? Okay, so both of you mentioned that. So how... How relevant is that strategy to this conversation, and how relevant is it to WaterFix in terms of funding and collaboration and partnership? I mean, I'll, I'll talk mm -hmm. to the cost at, at Hyperion. Uh, we are, are looking at, uh, you know, working with West Basin for the 70 million gallons a day that we have to do advanced, uh, some kind of what's called membrane uh, treatment, and, and the cost could be in the half a billion dollar. So the cost is a huge cost to do that, and but we have this partnership. We're doing a pilot on it, and eventually it's going to be a, a three-way 
partnership between sanitation, uh, water and power, and West Basin to figure out the finances. Uh, and that's something we're working through right now. So we, we believe there is potential for, uh, you know, uh, Hyperion. And the biggest thing with Hyperion and the issue we have is it's so far down the system. It's down by the ocean. And, and basically it's, it, uh, it limits what you can do there. That's why we're working really hard to identify uh, places that we can really expand in and, and distribute the water. So one of the things I said, for example, is in the San Fernando Valley, we're looking at taking uh, the East Valley wastewater that used to go to Hyperion, moving it back to Tillman so we can do groundwater recharge and making the distance closer. Those are the smart things we're doing, but we're focusing on Hyperion big times right now. You know, Enrique and, and some of the team, along with Water and Power, uh, are working very closely with West Basin as a first step, uh, doing this five, one and a half to five MGD for LAX uh, advanced water purification. But then the big thing is about 100 million gallons a day that we need to have some kind of regional collaboration uh, and with our uh, contract agencies and other to figure out how we can trade or distribute. Thank you. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, my understanding is that this, these assumptions here do not include that potential scenario and that large increase that we could see at IPR in that 100 million gallons a day. Okay. That helps. Thank you. Uh, just um, lastly, just a comment, and, and then we're going to obviously we'll get to item three, but my overarching concern has always been. Are we incorporating enough of, um, you know, one water and our goals for reclamation and, and recycling and gray water infrastructure into water fix? Uh, and, and that's just been my overarching concern about this whole approach. Uh, but I know that that's a presentation coming up after, yeah, that's item after this item. Two and three. So. Mr. Koretz, back to you. Okay, well, I have a few questions, but I still haven't gotten a satisfactory answer on, on the one I've been asking. And especially when we got this funding, I don't think there were any strings attached about what the rate would cost. That was just a straight offer of $20 million to, uh, to assist with uh, the effort in, in the San Fernando Valley Aquifer. So the only thing I had ever heard that was an obstacle was that our labor union didn't want the work done by Met, who has the expertise. Um, so I'm not understanding why that couldn't be done. Even if we started with another piece of that project, why we couldn't also be sending the $20 million and using it for uh, a clearly viable and important purpose to us? Yeah, I don't know that I have a better answer than what I gave, unfortunately. I, I, I hear you, though. I, you know, there is the Metropolitan Water District was very forthcoming in trying to work with us on that. Um, there were reasons why we didn't take them up on the offer. Um, you know, it, perhaps I can uh, get you a better answer um, on that than I've given you. And the better answer that I'd like to hear is that we're revisiting the issue and we're actually going to try to spend $20 million towards a, a project that will cost us hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's certainly a, a good start that we're looking uh, a gift horse in the mouth of. Yeah, it's about a $600 million project, and so, yeah, $20 million is a significant amount of money. Um, it really boils down to, you know, the approach and what uh, type of approach the department feels is the best to recover the basin and uh, whether they felt that um, there was really a role for what uh, the Metropolitan Water District had agreed to do with us. Okay, and how much have we looked at the seismic vulnerabilities of the California aqueduct and with and without the tunnels. Uh, are, are the new tunnels also uh, potentially uh, vulnerable? Now the, the new tunnels are going to be very robust when it comes to an earthquake. Um, they're going to be able to handle the maximum credible earthquake in the delta, whereas the levee system there was built by farmers. I mean, it, it's, you know, I hate to say it this way, but it's true. It's a lot of peat moss piled on top of each other. Uh, it's it's uh, really subject to liquefaction during, uh, if there was a, a seven point earthquake on the Hayward Fault, most of the delta levees will fail and you'll have a situation just like you had in New Orleans. And I know we're, we're looking at cutting our imported water by 50%. Um, will we be reaching out to DWP ratepayers to cover that? Well, to develop to, to get down to that level, uh, it's going to require a significant investment in local resource development. 
we knew that before we moved the five-year rate action. So when they came to my office and they asked me what's going to cost, we gave them all the cost data on what it would cost going forward to implement the local resource development program that I've shown you here today. And it's all in, ba baked into the base rate. So that's the local resource development piece of this is, is in the five-year rate action. And so rate payers are paying that and they'll pay for the tunnels in one form or another and presumably they'll pay for stormwater fees in the future. Well, again, the storm, the storm water is on the base rate. So, all, I, you know, when, when the base rate was looked at, we added in the San Fernando Basin cleanup. We looked at the, we added in storm water. We added in conservation. We added in recycled water. So that's all, all those local resource development uh, initiatives are baked into the base rate, that five-year rate increase. The met, the met water isn't on the base rate. So we buy met water on a pass-through. What that means is that when we don't buy much met water, so you have a really wet year like we just had, and we buy you know, tens of thousands of acre feet of met water, we pass that cost right through to the customer. So the customer's got a bill that has the base rate on it. It also has the pass-through rate on it. So there are those two rates. And when you don't buy a lot of met water, your pass-through rate automatically goes down. And when you buy a lot of met water, the, the pass-through rate automatically goes up. Not so with the base rate. Once you've passed the rate action on the base rate, it goes according to that base rate increase. You can't, it doesn't go up or down based on how much water you buy from Metropolitan. But the pass-through rate does vary based on how much purchased water you buy. And so if we're successful in developing local resources, the impacts of the met rate and the met rate increases that will occur to fund Cal Water Fix won't be as dramatic. If you don't do any local resource development and the costs go up on the met water, then the pass-through cost is going to escalate and you will feel it. So um, if we're successful in developing local resources, the impact of the Cal Water Fix financially on the rate payer won't be as heavy as it would be if we didn't develop local resources. Well, then the question is, which may be more appropriate for item number three, um, who pays for it if it's not us? Well, the way, you know, and that, that's a good question, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of question about that, uh, as you know. I mean, everybody's I heard. I want to stop you, but we need to really discuss that in item okay, two and three. Okay, that'd be fine. If we okay, can. I'll save it for that. De deviating from item one, so okay. I just want to stick to what we're here to do. And let me ask one, one other quick because question. Because that's a great question, and I want to get into Mr. Carrad's question as soon as that item comes up. Sure. And a quick item in passing uh, uh, from something that was mentioned earlier about uh, the programs at uh, UCLA and Rancho Park and all that. Uh, has anybody looked at working with the federal government at the cemetery? Because that's also a good opportunity for recycled water yeah. and certainly yeah. no one there will complain. Yeah, we're working with Water and Power. We actually identified the demand. No one there will complain? Yeah. <laughs> None of the constituents will complain about which water we're using. Okay, yeah. well that's one way to... So uh, with people, I we would actually work, we work together on identifying the demand in that area, uh, including, you know, parks, uh, the, the federal government facilities, uh, golf courses, etc., including UCLA. UCLA happens to be a large user and all that. So that demand is going to supply. It'll be a hub for all the users in the area for recycled water. It's not going to be just for one purpose only. So yeah. that has been looked at. I just wanted to make sure we were considering yeah. the federal government facilities. We're talking to the federal government, not the dead people, right? Yes. <laughs> the federal okay. government, not dead people. Mm -hmm. Is that it, Mr. Kurtz? That's it. Um, Mr. Cedillo, do you have any questions, sir? Look, I appreciate the conversation that obviously my only concern would be uh, this is premised on a lot of projections, right? As you just stated, so the question is what, what's the basis for us to expect that these projections will play out? Right? So what's the precedent? What we're are ambitious goals, and so we have a whole range of multiples for the, the acre, acre foot. But we're anticipating a lot of, you know, conservation, reclamation, restoration. Is there a basis, a premise, is it, rather than simply being aspirational about what we would like, is there like some trends and indicators of behavior during the drought uh, that we done? Precedent in other areas, uh, new technologies, etc. 
Very good question. And if you, you know, just, I'll just give you one example. I could give you others, but I'll, I'll talk about uh, where things were when I first started at the department. So when I first started at the department, um, our gallons per person per day water use was in the mid 180s. So people were using about 180 gallons per person per day in the city. So we um, started uh, a really aggressive water conservation program. Uh, we've been pursuing it for decades now. Uh, we've driven that water use trend all the way down to where it is today, which is about 103 gallons per person per day. So uh, that's a trend. Um, so we don't just straight line trends. If you look at the water conservation potential study and what it, what it looks at going forward, it shows a declining trend. We're not going to see the really dramatic water conservation drops that we've seen in the past because a lot of the really low-hanging fruit, I mean, back in the 80s when you flushed your toilet, you flushed, th you know, I hate to talk about this, but you flushed three and a half gallons of water down the toilet. When you go to Home Depot now and you buy a toilet, you flush 0.8 gallons down the toilet when you flush it. So those kind of, you know, things have been done. And now we're left with things that are higher dollar, lower yield water conservation efforts. And in particular, it, you know, we're into landscape irrigation uh, and things outdoors. So a lot of the really cheap stuff's been done. The more expensive stuff is going forward. And if you look at our, the trends in our long range uh, planning for conservation, and our conservation potential studies show that it's going, to be, it's going to become increasingly difficult to drive demands down uh, through water conservation efforts and, and increasingly more expensive. So we're not just straight lining it. We do take a look at what's out there and what it'll cost and what it'll yield. Right, there's going to be tipping points that we're, we're getting where we just lose efficiency. Yeah, people, I, you know, I don't use the term that often because people rebel against it, but I mean, there is such a thing as demand hardening. And, you know, it, it does slow down the yield on your investments in conservation over time. So, Council Member Cedillo, you, you mentioned what's driving this too. So part of preparation of the urban water management plan is required by the state to mandatorily submit the plan. <clears throat> As part of the plan, we're required to look at these various scenarios, looking at dry year scenarios. So the state wants to make sure that for cities that serve water, um, you know, to a large amount of customers, make sure that the city does have a plan to meet those dry years when we have, you know, situations like this. That the city has developed a plan in order to be able to meet demands within the city. So. This is part of a state requirement that we have to prepare uh, these plans every five years. Um, and it takes into account, you know, uh, impacts of future climate change as well. So we do incorporate that into our forecast to make sure the city has adequate supplies to meet, you know, future growth in the city. Is that it? Well, thank you very much. You know, I have my own opinion about why uh, in terms of the water supply in the San Fernando Valley and the efforts to remediate any contamination. Um, in the San Fernando Valley particularly, it has to do with where the current contamination exists, communities of colors and communities that I represent. So it's never been a priority of the city to get to those folks because our priority has always been to get the water to other parts of the city, allow the San Fernando Valley water to flow into the river, and then uh, you back it up with Sacramento water. I grew up there my entire life. You have to go back and look at history in terms of why it is that we've never taken care of remediating water in the San Fernando Valley. And then that needs to be said over and over again until we do right by those people. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we're going to move on to items number two and three. Certainly, Madam Chair. Item two and three. Two relates to the Department of Water and Power report relative to the Metropolitan Water District's rate setting practices and approaches. And number three, also DWP and Office of Public Accountability reports relative to an overview of financial assessment for the Bay Delta Conservation Project. Both of these matters were continued from your, your special meeting on August 29th. Thank you very much. And, and before we get started on um, this, this topic, colleagues, I do want to state that it's fair to say that we all have concerns, especially uh, regarding this project as it pertains to the impacts of our ratepayers. Um, and we need to emphasize and make sure that we understand this project and that MWD uh, prioritizes ratepayers as they move forward with any decision when it comes to this project. Um, I'm certainly very um, uh, critical of, of ratepayers having to fork the bill for something like this. I would hate for the water fix project to become a runaway project with uh, escalating costs for MWD, particularly Angelino. So I want to 
make sure that I state that up front. Those are my concerns. Um, and we cannot lose focus on our commitments to better capture local water um, and not import it from other places. I want to make sure we don't run away from that commitment that we've made to our ratepayers and our residents. So I'm going to go ahead and allow you to make your presentations and then take questions. Um, and I have recommendations that we, as we move forward, but I'll state those at the end. Go ahead. Okay, well, the, there are um, rate case scenarios and uh, rate impacts on uh, Metropolitan's rates from the California water fix. Now, uh, at their long-range finance plan meeting, and this was last week on Monday, they showed their long-range finance plan with the California water fix in it. And uh, the California water fix wasn't all of the increase they project, but it's a portion of it. And if you add the California water fix and all the other initiatives that the Metropolitan Water District is planning on investing in going forward, you're looking at about a 4.5% rate increase a year on the cost of purchased water. So that's what the, you recall that in our rates we have a base rate and we have a purchased water rate. And the base rate is the one that was the five-year rate increase was passed by the city. The purchased water cost goes up and down based on the cost of met water and how much water you buy. Their projection for MET rates are 4.5% increase going forward every year. Right now, a uh, cost of uh, an acre foot of uh, raw water from MET is about $650 an acre foot uh, on the untreated side. Can I, can I yes, interrupt? sir. Yes, sir, Councilmember okay. Casidio. Apologize for me. Sure. The, uh, but you said this was... This was um, it's it's not fixed on the NWD side. It's that no. our our everything that we had laid out is set into the to the base. That's correct. And so, assuming we perform at the optimum level, then the, our demand on the MWD purchases could be lower. That's correct. And so, it's not set. So it is. It's it, in essence, we're incentivized to be good consumers, so that then we can uh, uh, purchase less. That is correct. There are a couple of caveats I want to explain mm -hmm. to you just to be completely honest with you, uh, it depends uh, on how Metropolitan handles these costs. So uh, Council Member Kretz is very familiar with the Metropolitan Water District and what goes on over there. Um, you know, costs can be uh, shifted at the Metropolitan Water District from one agency to another agency based on how those costs are allocated. So uh, back when the State Water Project was, this is a little history, back when the State Water Project was first built and first being contemplated, the City of Los Angeles didn't support it. And the reason we didn't support it is because it was being fully funded on the backs of property tax. And the City of LA was disproportionately contributing to the property tax. So the City eventually did support the State Water Project and the, and the quid pro quo was that the Metropolitan Water District would wean itself off of property tax as its primary source of funding and on to the commodity rate for selling water. So they started having their revenue come from the sale of water rather than from property taxes. So they went from a, a almost entirely fixed revenue stream on property tax to a revenue stream that was based on how much water they sold. And then the city supported it. So, you know, the concern here is that if, if the Cal Water Fix costs stay on the commodity rate and you develop local resources, the impact of that commodity rate like Councilmember CDO said, will be less. But if those costs are placed on property taxes or alternatively those costs are placed on a large fixed charge that MET adopts and puts into its rate case, then whether you develop local resources or not, you're going to be tagged with that fixed charge. So that's one of the concerns about how this is structured. So, you know, we've been advocates for... Uh, making sure that uh, the costs stay on the commodity rate. Now, there is logic to that on a number of reason, ways, because if you had to pay for your water, whether you conserved it or not, would you have any incentive to conserve it? Would you have any incentive to recycle it? Would you have any incentive to capture storm water and develop it? No, because you've got to pay for it whether you use it or don't use it. So when you develop large blocks of fixed costs that are tagged to ratepayers, whether they use the water or not, then you lose a lot of the incentive for water use efficiency and conservation efforts. So that's going to be the challenge, I believe, going forward, is just uh, not only, you know, what the Cal Water Fix is going to cost, but how those costs are allocated among the MET member agencies. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the funding, first of all, because so I suspect that farmers in the Central Valley and frackers in Kern County are going to find ways to pay less of it than they should. But then if we develop all our local resources and we're not using much of met water in most years, then I don't know who the hell pays for it or how that, how that plays out. Um, so if, if that allows just about everybody to wriggle off the hook for some degree, then to some degree, then you have no one paying it. Well, there are practical limitations on how much water Metropolitan is going to sell. As you recall, when you go through the, the budget uh, discussions every other year, they have a two-year budget, uh, they make projections of sales. And those projections are fairly conservative. I mean, uh, typically they're projecting that they sell about 1.7 million acre feet a year. That's a fairly conservative number. Now, of course, in this really wet year, they were down to about 1.5. So, that, you know, they did sell less than that. But uh, they typically budget there based on a fairly modest level of sales. Um, so if you budget to a fairly modest level of sales, you probably won't have a problem uh, as far as your financial uh, issues are concerned. I mean, Metropolitan does have to, to manage those swings in sales, they have a, a reserve fund. As you recall, they have several hundred million dollars in that reserve fund. And they draw that reserve fund. It goes up or down based on sales. And if they sell less than they projected in their uh, budget, they draw money out of those reserves. If they sell more than they budget for, that money flows into those reserves. So the reserve account acts as kind of a shock absorber absorber against variability in sales. Uh, that's the way it's always worked at Metropolitan. We've supported that approach. And if you have that type of approach, you don't need large blocks of fixed, car, fixed costs. Yeah, I, I have to point out, among other things, uh, uh, I don't consider Met to be a 100% trustworthy agency. And uh, while I was there, I certainly saw them giving their ethics officer a hard time because they were actually pursuing ethics. And they've just recently forced that person out um, and don't have a replacement. So uh, uh, that gives me pause because I think they're an agency that needs more oversight <coughs> rather than less. Um, on the budget question, I know the Westlands Water District is possibly voting today on whether to approve water fix. But their, their motion to approve that puts conditions that sound as if they can't be met. So what happens if Westland approves participation, but in such a way that they actually don't participate? Well, the project isn't going to move forward unless it's fully funded. So um, you know, you've got the Central Valley contractors. You've got the State Water Project contractors. Like you said, they're all going to take votes on who's in, who's out. and. Uh, if only 50% of the cost of the project are funded by people who want to participate and nobody's willing to pick up the other 50% of the cost, then the project's not going to go forward. It has to be fully funded. But I, I suspect what's going to happen is you'll have uh, the large agencies, uh, Kern, Metropolitan, uh, you know, Westlands Water District, uh, Santa Clara are going to vote um, to support the project. That'll be the lion's share of the cost. You'll probably have some of the smaller players who opt out. Their shares will be out on the table for purchase. You'll have some of the larger agencies who are interested in picking up additional water supplies, maybe pick up those shares. Uh, Metropolitan, I, I'm, I don't know this for sure. It's just conjecture on my part. But I suspect the 26% of the total project cost that Metropolitan is going to be voting on on December 10th will go up after that. There'll be more than that vote. So you'll have the vote on the 10th for the 26% of the cost. And then if that's a yes vote and there are other yes votes and you have a block of shares that are available that nobody wants to pick up, I think there'll be additional votes at the Metropolitan Water District to determine whether they want to pick up those excess shares or not. So the October 10th vote for 26%, I think there'll be other votes. How high Met's percentage will be in the end, 
Uh, I don't know what, what it will be, but I suspect it's going to be higher than 26%. So on the Westlands vote, they, their staff report recommends approval, but only if two conditions are met. One of them is that the State Water Resources Control Board uh, doesn't impose additional restrictions. So if they vote it that way, and at a later point uh, the board votes additional restrictions, then they've left themselves an out. So do we count them as part of the funding, or do we recognize that they've structured this in a way where they can get out, and then everyone else is left holding that part of the bag? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I was unaware that they had done that. Um, I, I don't know what the repercussions of uh, you know, approvals that have opt-out clauses in the approval are. I, I don't know um, how that's going to play out. And also, I understand on a different subject that the State Water Aqueduct has had some subsidence problems uh, because they, uh, due to pumping during the drought and the low levels. Um, what's being done to fix that problem, and how does the tunnel project impact that? Very good question. I, you know, there are what it's done is it has uh, reduced the capacity in certain portions of that aqueduct system uh, below what it originally was before the subsidence occurred. So uh, I don't know what the plans to fix that are, but I suspect that um, those areas where the land has subsided and the project isn't uh, doesn't have the capacity that it needs to have, you can address that. But um, I haven't seen any plans to address it. But I am aware of the problem. So if it were addressed, would it be part of the tunnel project and funded through that or, or a side? No, I think that'll be a separate project. Um, you know, there's, there are capacity constraints in each branch as well. So there, there are regular operation and maintenance issues on the project that have to be paid for and funded by the, the state water project contractors over time. That's, that's something that uh, gets allocated based on table A allocations. Um, so that, that's something that uh, has to go forward with or without the Cal Water fix. Okay. Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a, a comment that I'm, I'm going to defer to you on your recommendations. But there is no question that Los Angeles needs to look at the long-term future of its water needs. I think that's crystal clear for everyone. Uh, and this has received a lot of media attention. And, and the refrain has always been that the water fix program doesn't preclude general conservation goals, but my concern is that it doesn't include them either. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real concern for Los Angeles, especially given our needs here. Uh, and so I think uh, we, I certainly need uh, some more answers before I'm comfortable uh, supporting it. Um, but nonetheless, I appreciate the good work that's, that's been uh, done on this. Uh, and hopefully uh, we can either do some bargaining, impose some conditions, uh, and I look forward to hearing your recommendations, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Mr. Kokoria, do you have anything? Yeah, just a, a couple comments, I guess. Um, I, I, I think my concerns about this fall into three categories, or the, the issues that I'm, I'm wrestling with fall into three categories. One is what we've all talked about is the ratepayer impact. Um, two is the larger environmental concerns of going forward or not going forward with a major capital project like this. And then third is um, uh, sustainability in, uh, or in the face of potential catastrophe for Los Angeles uh, in, the, in the loss of the Delta as a water source and loss of other water sources, uh, particularly for the Valley. Um, on, the, on the rate payer impact side, um, you touched exactly on one of the principal concerns I have, which is the ability to shift these costs um, onto uh, to, to make these sunk costs uh, supported by property taxes and, and otherwise than, than usage. Um, and throughout the discussion on this, I had been sort of relying on the representation that we would pay for our share. But Los Angeles has the largest property tax, you know, base for, um, for MET. I, you know, our, rate, our taxpayers have a very significant concern if that shift were made and the bulk of that, um, of MET's support of this project were put onto 
property tax rates rather than um, than usage rates. So I guess the, the first question I would have is, and, and I know you've you've described your advocacy to try to ensure that that doesn't happen, but if we were to move forward with any position on this, and if we were to support a project like this, how can we get, what do we have to do to get some assurance that that's not going to happen before we buy the pig and the poke? Well, that's a challenge. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that any particular Metropolitan Water District board can bind a future board on how it allocates costs on its rates. So, um, you know, as far as putting it on property taxes, um, I think that would be more of a challenge for the Metropolitan Water District than trying to find a fixed charge on their rates to allocate it to. But either way, uh, it's a cost that would be uh, shifted on to ratepayers who uh, are trying to develop local resources. Um, it, it's a challenge. I, I don't know that there's an easy answer for that. I think that um, if you were in a position where you were uh, inclined to uh, support the project and approve it, uh, perhaps you could also express your um, support for uh, commodity charges as the primary uh, way to pay for uh, these things. Um, I think the commodity rate has worked very well at Metropolitan for many years. It's uh, something that you do hear the Met Board talk against uh, periodically. There's uh, a lot of talk about coming up with a higher level of fixed charges over there. Um, so yes, I mean, it's a real concern. Um, there is no question that we should at least do that. I, I would feel uh, a lot more secure if there were some way that we could make our support con or our investment conditional on it. But it's it's we're, once we've agreed to this, and it goes forward, twenty years from now, some tax you know property taxpayer may end up paying a higher rate than they expect that they're going to because of future actions of of Met. Right? It's possible. Okay, so um, that's that's on that point. To the to Mr. Kretz's point, um, I'm actually less concerned about the issue of whether or not others are going to participate as well, um, and who who's in, who's out, because there won't the project won't go forward unless there's adequate commitment to funding the the project. So, um, although that does heighten my concern a little bit about shifts onto the property tax rules. Um, in terms of the environmental uh, issues, of course they're, they're vast, and I don't want to go all into that because I think we could be here for days if we started discussing all of that. But I, I do just want to say to, to my friends in the environmental community too that um, Mr. Cedillo and Mr. Kretz and I grappled with this issue in the late Middle Ages when we were still members of the legislature. Um, this has got, somebody made reference to the peripheral tunnels, which I thought was, was terrific and hilarious. Uh, this is, you know, go, this goes way, way back. And um, I, I think we all have to remember, too, that, yeah, there are, are going to be environmental consequences of this project, perhaps severe environmental consequences. There are also severe environmental consequences of inaction on the delta. This delta is the most important delta in North America, and in fact, in, in the Western Hemisphere. And, um, you know, continuing inaction on this is leading to continuing seawater intrusion. It's, it's you know, leading to species loss. It, it leaves us vulnerable to the potential for catastrophe and flooding that would, would be devastating to the most important ecosystem on the west coast of North and South America. So inaction, it, this is not a, you know, this is not a, a, an issue where we do the environmentally bad thing or we do the environmentally good thing. There are consequences to inaction that are severe and potentially catastrophic. And so I just want to temper our environmental discussion with, with that as well. And then in terms of the um, resiliency issue, it, it, this tilts me very heavily in support of, uh, or I should say, my, my concern about the future of the San Fernando Valley is um, significant. Without guaranteeing this state water project uh, resource, um, I think the San Fernando Valley is exceptionally vulnerable to a 
devastating catastrophe in the event of even a moderate earthquake, not even a severe earthquake, a moderate earthquake in, in the Delta area, um, you know, that would, that would cut that water supply off. We don't have a backup plan right now. And it's great that we'll be done with our remediation in 2025, maybe. Um, you know, we started this project when Ronald Reagan was president. You know, there was still a Cold War. There was still apartheid in South Africa. You know, I mean, we've done a lot in the world since this became a Superfund site. And still, we're trying to figure out a fix for getting, you know, you know, contaminants out of the groundwater. It's just, it's mind-boggling to me that this has taken over, you know, I, I didn't have any gray hair when this started. And so it's just, it's mind-boggling that we're still do, uh, doing it. But because we don't have that backup plan, and, and I mean, your numbers here, even just as I've understood, even if we did, even if we'd finished it all, it still wouldn't be enough for, to, to provide adequate security to the San Fernando Valley. It's our most important resource, but it's not a an adequate resource by itself. And so that concern about resilience is a, is a significant concern to me as a representative of the Valley. So, but Madam Chair, Thank I'm you, looking Mr. forward to hearing your recommendation. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kokorian. Mr. Sayo, do you have any questions? No, uh, yes, um, or a comment. Oh. I concur um, uh, with my colleague in terms of our experience in the Capitol and, and how it gave us a, a, a broader perspective I would say, for example, those who have to understand the, the fix is what it is. It's a conveyance plan. It's a conveyance strategy. It's a way for us to get supply, perhaps not adequate, but clearly if we fail to get the supply, we'll be more vulnerable. So it gives us more security, not less. Uh, and then it's for us to manage supply in this region. And so I think we have to, to look at it in that perspective. Uh, I think there's an interesting conversation about um, MET and how we get charged. I, I agree with you that you take away incentives and then there's no motivation for people to, to conserve and engage in the other activities. Uh, but I also note that there's this question if we rely on property tax, well, we may obviously have more property tax, there's also a question of consumption. I mean, we are, uh, you know, with, with the property comes the, the the utilization on the property, whether it's, it's homeowners or it's industrial businesses or commercial businesses, whatever the case may be, there's going to be consumption based upon who sits on the property, who sits on the land. So that that element of it is, hasn't been talked about or measured or, or part of this discussion. Um, and so finally, I, I just think, uh, and I know um, Councilmember O'Farrell had raised this question. It doesn't have these elements in it, but it's not designed to have those elements in it. I think that's for us. That's our job. To design those elements: the, the reclamation, the conservation, the restoration, etc. That's for us to do. Uh, the fix is really a, a, a effort to to modernize conveyance and recognize that we are one state uh, and that we are all interdependent. Uh, we must all rely upon each other. I, I think down here we don't have a sensitivity for the incredible battles that there are for people who oppose the conveyance from the north. I don't mm. think we have any right to the water. I don't think we should have their water. Uh, or uh, the challenges in the Central Valley. Well, they're big consumers. They're also pretty big producers of our little habit of eating three times a day. And so we have to keep all those things in, uh, in context. Thank you, Mr. Sidhu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've heard about, but I, I'm not entirely clear on how much the Delta protections have changed. But my understanding is that since the original proposal, there's less good work on, on the environmental side in the Delta than was originally proposed. So how much has that gotten weakened since the first tunnel proposal? Well, I don't know about weakened, but it has changed. I mean, uh, when there was a, when it was called the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, you had uh, the ecosystem restoration efforts and the tunnel project were together. And it was under the umbrella of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. But now it's been bifurcated. So now you have what's called eco-restore, and that 
restoration program is the primary restoration program for the ecosystem in the delta. And you have the Cal Water Fix. And the Cal Water Fix is the tunnel project and the mitigation for that tunnel project. So they're two different efforts, Cal Water Fix and the Eco Restore program. So it has changed. Um, what is going to be voted on in, on October 10th by the Metropolitan Water District is the, the California Water Fix. The Eco Restore program, uh, there's going to be a workshop this month at the Metropolitan Water District. They are going to have the people who are familiar with what's going on with Eco Restore report on the progress with Eco Restore and what, it's, what the status currently is, uh, but we haven't gotten that information yet. So the bottom line is that we shouldn't be under any any misapprehensions that by approving this tunnel and actually building the tunnel, we're doing the environmental work. That's a completely different project and has nothing to do with the tunnel project now. The well, the, the, the mitigation for the tunnel project will move forward, so you, you are be going to be funding the mitigation for the tunnel. But as far as the entire Eco Restore program for the Delta, that's a different, that's a different animal altogether. Okay. Um, I only had two questions, and uh, do we have a new timeline that MWD um, is using for consideration, and do you have any information on new financials or data uh, information on how this is all going to be structured? Do you have anything new to share with us? Yeah, well, nothing new, but I mean, we, there will be a workshop this, this month to talk about the Cal Water Fix at the Metropolitan Water District. Um, our, our five directors will be there uh, for that uh, discussion. Um, there will be a vote on, the tw on whether Metropolitan Water District will fund 26% of the Cal Water Fix on the 10th of October. Uh, so that's going forward now. Uh, they did put out last Monday their long-range finance plan projections that include the Cal Water Fix in those projections. Uh, I didn't uh, bring that with me today, but I can so tell you. that's out already. That's out already, the long-range finance plan with, with the Cal Water Fix in it. Shows about a 4.5% rate increase uh, going forward uh, with the Cal Water Fix. So that's, that will impact our rate payers uh, on the uh, purchase water side. So the purchase water pass-through charges for our customers will go up uh, about 4.5% on average uh, going forward. Uh, that four and a half percent isn't all cow water fix. Uh, a portion of it is, but that's that's what we're looking at. Mm. All right, thank you. I know there's MWD um, staff here today, so I just hope that you understand the significance of what we're discussing here today. And Mr. Petty Joan, I, I think it's cr critical that you share and, er, share and convey our concerns um, at the next DWD. Um, M WD board meeting that you're scheduled to be at. I think it's important for you to share with them. We would just discuss here this this afternoon. Okay, I'll make sure I share it with our directors. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, members, I have the following recommendations. On item two, I'd like for us to keep that item in committee, but I want DWP to prepare a report reviewing MWD's annual budget for the past 10 years and provide the council with an annual breakdown on MWD's budgeting for local resource development. That's on item number two. And for item three, I recommend that we request uh, DWP to provide comment and request confirmation and assurances from MWD that our financial, environmental, and local water principles are protected as follows. The project cost will be based on either a $16.7 billion estimate provided in MWD's white papers or the amount validated by DWP's resources, whichever is lower. Number two, MWD preparation, if any, shall be capped at 26% of this project's cost. Number three, MWD financial investment shall come last and only after all participants have committed. Number four, any increase in MWD's participation rate above these amounts should be approved by ballot measure. Number five, any purchases of additional water supply should only come after the project is fully financed rather than serve to further subsidize construction costs at the expense of local ratepayers. Number six, any participation of MWD shall be contingent on the California Eco Restored Initiative being fully funded. 
Number seven, MWD will increase our financial investment in local water, including local water storm capture and related initiatives. And number eight, MWD will invest resources to remediate contamination, contaminated water in the San Fernando Valley. And I want to further move that we instruct DWP to report back on the following. Number one, a review of DWP's low income life program and ways to improve and increase enrollment and participation. Number two, a review of DWP's efforts to remediate the contaminated groundwater in the San Fernando Valley, including the cost and the funds identified. And number three, a review of DWP's water supply and delivery infrastructure for the valley and ways DWP will help reduce the valley's reliance on water imported from the state water project. Members, thank you very much. That is seconded by Mr. Kokorian. Is there anything else? Mr. Cedillo. I'm just on, on the, the mandates or the restrictions that we're placing on, on uh, Matt. Does it matter whether or not we have capacity or authority to, to do that? I think these are recommendations and certainly things that we can negotiate with MWD. Is that correct, Mr. Perijon? Uh, There's think nothing gives... that precludes us from getting some of these assurances before we commit to something. Yeah, I, I think it gives uh, the kind of uh, negotiation. directions for, for our directors that will be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. If there's no objection, that motion carries. Thank you very much for being here. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.